Good morning and welcome to News Desk here on the Joy News Channel. Coming up, this our Office of the Special Prosecutor says it has begun investigations into suspected corruption and corruption-related offences in illegal small-scale mining. We have details as we bring you the second part of our latest hotline documentary, Dab Distraction for Gold. Also, Africa has world's highest suicide rate and Ghana loses $5.5 billion to mental health disorders with 16,000 persons suffering from severe mental illness on the streets. That, according to the World Health Organization. We'll tell you more on this. And the time to pick and wear our old high school uniforms is here. As a national science and math quiz begins today, with fans asking or past winners like in fans uh, at Chimote School, seeing Thomas Aquinas and other NSMQ giants go beyond the quarterfinal stage this year. We'll find out. We have business and uh, sports all coming up this hour. Remember, we are live on DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 144. Stay with us for details. Now, illegal miners have invaded the Patahon and Traboum forest at Dompem in the western region, but the chief of the area says he is helpless against the continuous destruction of the environment. Major streams that join the river Bonsa have been highly polluted, but the war chief of Dompem says he is helpless in the face of rising illegal mining in the area. When Love News confronted the miners, they indicated they will continue to engage in the illegal activity in the absence of jobs. Is I accept of the second part of our hotline documentary, Destruction for Gold by Rastos Asari Donko. So, very active mining going on within the Pataon forest, uh, close to Dumpim in the western region. The river Nui has been blocked in two, and you can see the miners over there actively mining this resource. Is this legal? Uh, it's illegal. But you're doing it anyway. Uh, because of uh, we don't have anything to do as our permanent job. That's why we are doing it. Because this very engine that we are using used to cause a harm to a lot of people. Uh, a time ago, it caused a harm to a lot of people. But because of we not getting anything doing as our job, that's why we are still doing this. Here, we find a number of excavators clearing the riverbed in the middle of a large pool of residue and devastated forest cover. The people here will not tolerate our visit nor speak to us. But we are told that this irresponsible mining activity is sanctioned by a number of powerful people. The River Nui is no longer identifiable from the pits that fill this valley. These muddy looking men and women represent unemployment, the struggles of youth and the determination to do anything to survive, including participating in this illegal gold mining activity here. There are no jobs in town. If you don't give us jobs, Galamse is what we will continue to do. That has been a very big major problem for me. A worried chief of Dumpim, Nana Nyuapenin IV, says he's helpless in the face of rising illegal mining in the area. It is very, very serious. All the river bodies in the various places you are talking of, there were rivers that we could fetch and then drink those days. But for now, you saw some yourself. It is very bad. Before you get there, then they've bolted away and you will not see them again. The next time you see them, you hear that they are at the Trebon Forest. You dispatch men to that place, you go and then they are not there. So they are, it is very hard to monitor their activities. The River Nui and other highly polluted rivers and streams at Dumpim link other water bodies like the Bonsa close to Takwa in the western region. 
Meanwhile, the Office of the Special Prosecutor says it has begun investigation into illegal mining involving persons who are politically exposed. Now, it says the Office of the Special Prosecutor has commenced an investigation into suspected corruption and corruption-related offences in respect of illegal small-scale mining. The investigation targets some officials of the Ministry of Land and Natural Resources and the Forestry Commission. It also targets the activities and expenditure of the dissolved Interministerial Committee on Illegal Mining, especially in respect of the seizure and management of excavators, machinery, uh, road vehicles, and gold nuggets. The investigation includes the active and ongoing inquiry into allegations of use of public office for profit against uh, Charles Bissu during his tenure as secretary to the IMCIM, uh, arising from an investigative documentary titled Galamse Fraud Part 1, published by Tiger IPI. The investigation further targets the activities of Akunta Mining Limited and other companies, nationals of foreign uh, uh, countries allegedly involved in illegal mining and allegations of corruption and corruption-related offences against some municipal and district chief executives and political party officials. This was signed by Kwisi Ejabing the uh, special prosecutor. Now, earlier you had a set of our uh, second part of the hotline documentary, Destruction for Good. It will be airing this, uh, uh, you know, this evening at 8.30 p.m. on the Joy News channel on TV. You're also watching the news desk now. Moving on, the World Health Organization has reviewed Africa as the highest rate of people dying by suicide in the world. In a statement, the agency said Africa is home to six of uh, the ten countries with the highest suicide rate globally. The continent is said to have one psychiatrist for every 500,000 inhabitants, 100 times less than the World Health Organization recommendation. Around 11 people per 100,000 per year die by suicide in the African region, higher than the global average of 9 per 100,000 people, the World Health Organization says. Mental health problems account for up to 11,000 of the risk factors associated with suicide. It continued. So what is Ghana's case in terms of people dying from suicide? Kofi Ajay of our health desk joins me live with a breakdown. Kofi, thanks. Uh, how is Ghana's case looking like? Uh, Kofi, kindly unmute so we can follow what you're telling us. Uh, let us understand how Ghana's case is looking like in terms of people dying by suicide and people who are suffering from mental disorders. Please, can you hear me now? Yes, clearly now. Yeah. So I was saying that uh, the World Bank, uh, the WHO actually projects that, you know, 10% of Ghana's population has one form of mental health disorder uh, or the other. You know, that's um, the, the projection. So if you look at this 10%, what does it simply mean? It means that uh, with a population of uh, 30 uh, 0.8 million, you have about uh, over three, uh, 3 million Ghanaians suffering from, you know, different forms of mental health disorder. Now, if you want to really paint a picture with this 10%, with this 3 million population that I'm talking about, it's more or less like filling the Accra Sports Stadium, which is about 40,000, you know, uh, that's the capacity of Accra Sports Stadium. That's about 77 times of the Accra Sports Stadium. If, if, if it is filled to its full capacity, that will be the total number of Ghanaians suffering from different forms of mental health. So it's a very dire situation. Mm. Now, break it down further for us, because we understand that, uh, you know, 10% of Ghana's population has one form of mental disorder or the other. We also know that uh, there's a breakdown where about 41% of the people uh, are suffering from psychological disorders. So, so give us the details as, as, as it's contained in that document. Right, so this 41% that you just talked about is a subset of the 10% that we, um, we spoke about earlier. So this 41% of Ghanaians have psychological stress. And this is very, you know, categorical. I say psychological stress. So it's a subset of the 10% population that we're speaking about. And this um, um, psychological stress that we're talking about uh, can be mild, moderate, or severe. That's according to to the WHO. So if you look at this uh, 41% we're talking about, it can be, it's not of the population. So you can have this number being less than the 3 million population that we spoke about suffering from different forms of mental health disorder. So this is a subset of the, the, the 10% that we spoke about earlier. 
Mm. Again, um, you, you alluded to this earlier, 16,000 persons with severe mental illness. But in the World Health Organization document, they point to the fact that um, we have less psychiatrists to, to patient ratio, and that's why this is, this is uh, uh, accounting for that. Exactly. So on your screens now is a survey done by the Ghana Health Service, uh, and the survey points out that there are about 16,000 uh, persons who are persons with severe mental health illness. And these people are actually on the streets. Um, so you can see on the streets of Accra, Kumasi, and other places that we've spoken, we've spoken about. But if you look at what you were also saying, the, the mental health care delivery facilities we have as a country. So if you look at uh, psychiatric hospitals as a country, we have just about three psychiatric hospitals. We have three regional hospitals supporting, four regional hospitals supporting this a psychiatric hospital. They're, they're also teaching hospitals supporting in the in the fight against mental health illness. So they are also mm. district hospitals. So four categories: psychiatric hospitals, regional hospitals, teaching hospitals, and then district hospitals. Chris. Okay. Now, with a sixteen thousand, what is the makeup? So the sixteen thousand are actually those on the streets and mental health illness, as we know would definitely come um, with a certain cost to the state. So if you project this, um, it's about 7% of the country's GDP that we spend as a country to, to battle this mental health. It's about 5.5 billion you know, um, US dollars. And that's how much we lose as a country as a result of mental health illness. So look at the uh, Ghana Health Service on their websites right now. They've actually indicated that Every year, we spend close to about 1.4% of the health ministry's budget on mental health alone. That's about 160 million Ghana cities we're talking about every year that we spend on mental health illnesses. So finally, probably, we can also talk about the, 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 the workforce who are actually working in this mental health you know, um, institution. So if you look at the number of psychiatrists we have, as a country is 39. Um, so if you look at 3 million population suffering from different forms of mental health illnesses and you have just 39 psychiatric, that should tell you how that the situation is. Psychology is 244, that's a bit more than the number of psychiatrists. We also have mental health um, social workers being about 362,000. Mental health illnesses, um, sorry, nurses are actually um, um, the, the biggest number we see there was about 2,463,000 ,000, and occupational therapies being just six um, of the workforce. Mm. All right, Kofi, I'm grateful uh, for the break that you've given us. Now, for more on this, uh, we've been joined on, on, on Zoom by Humphrey Kofi, uh, who is into the field of psychology and psychiatry, uh, so we can have more on this. Now, Humphrey, thank you for your time. What is that counting for what we are seeing? 41% of Ghanaians are having psychological disorder according to data available. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Indeed, the situation could even be dire um, beyond what uh, the research has revealed. Um, currently, we are having some mass exodus of psychiatric nurses leaving the country for greener pastures. If you go to the psychiatric hospital, the three main psychiatric hospitals, you realize that there are a greater number of these nurses who are leaving. Um, for, the for the psychologists, we don't even have to talk about it because the numbers, even though from the research look quite higher than the psychiatrist, it's still, not inadequ it's still inadequate in relation to the ratio of uh, the population we have. So the situation is even not getting better. Mm. Now, like you alluded to the fact that we have, you know, lesser rate in terms of expert to patient ratio. How do we address this particular challenge? We're losing a lot of our expert uh, to, for, to, to, to foreign uh, countries. How do you address it? So, for instance, you ask yourself, what is the motivation for these people who are leaving? What exactly is motivating them to go? And the bottom line is about the, their salaries, it's about how they are being catered for, it's about how the risk involved in the area of health is also being managed. Because 
if you are dealing with people with mental health disorders and you are in a psychiatric facility, um, you stand some risk of being, I mean, some higher risk than other conditions that you'll be taking care of. So how is this risk being managed and what is it that somebody can benefit from? Should there be any situation where the person is being, is hurt by somebody who is under such a, a psychological district? So if there is no motivation, then the risk is higher. And if the salaries are not better, then the risk of people leaving for greener pastures where they are very much welcome is also going to be higher. Mm. Uh, but, but again, we are, we are made to understand that we are spending $5.5 billion annually on, on mental health issues. Do we know where and where exactly these monies are expended on? Well, so definitely it will be on salaries, it will be on um, uh, monies given to the facilities to run. Already we, uh, this money that we are talking about looks big, but it's quite inadequate because um, the psychiatric hospitals are already talking about lack of medication, which is a perennial problem and has never been solved ever since I got into this area of mental health. I mean, medication has always been a problem. I, I don't know when we can find a solution. Again, feeding of patients is also an issue. I mean, Accra Psychiatric Hospital has already complained. Not only them, but even Ankafo has also complained. So we are not addressing the issues headlong. We are always finding a knee-jerk reaction to solving some of these problems, and it's not helping them anyway. So the issue will continue to linger on until we have a holistic approach, ensure that there are enough psychologists and mental health delivery and provision is a, it's a holistic thing that requires psychologists, occupational therapists, uh, mental health uh, nurses, uh, psychiatrists, a whole lot of people, so that there, there will be a one-stop support for anybody who is in psychological distress or suffering from any mental health condition. Mm. Now, the report talks about the fact that uh, a lot of these experts that we do have are located in the urban areas more. So it means that we need more people in the rural areas. But we, again, are short of numbers. You're talking about proactive or um, uh, holistic solution to the, to the challenge. What will be your proposal, your holistic uh, proposal, to solving the challenge of mental health? So, for instance, if you, like we, you have also alluded to the other psychiatric hospitals, other psychiatric hospitals are in the southern part of Ghana. Talk about Pantan, talk about Accra Psychiatric Hospital, talk about um, Ankafo. In the middle belt, in the Ashanti region and Brown Harbour, and also in the northern region, there are no psychiatric hospitals. Much as we are talking about community care and emphasizing on community support rather than institutionalization, it is so important that we have some of these psychiatric hospitals where at least there will be some short stay for people who are in some of these uh, situations so that at least they are monitored and they are taken care of. So it's not like um, keeping people in the psychiatric hospital door we are trying to decongest, but to ensure that people have access to mental health care, at least to the closest minimum distance that they can run. So we will equally need a psychiatric hospital in the Ashanti or Brown that will serve Ashanti and Brown Hapo. And then we need also one in the, in the northern region to serve the, the population over there. Because when the situation is dire, they are moved all the way from the north, from the Ashanti, to the to the to the, to the uh, southern belt, which is Accra, Pantine, and then Ankapo. These things have to be resolved. Also, we need to ensure that at least every chip compound, every chip compound, which is the barest um, level of um, health support, has mental health services. At least the primary mental health services is available for people who can access it at their closed door rather than traveling. And when the situation gets, I mean, dire, that, that will require their traveling, that's okay. But at least to the barest minimum of their residence, there should be some support in terms of mental health services. Thank you, uh, Humphrey Kofi, for making time to join us here on News Desk. Now, the time to pick and wear our old school uniforms is here. As the National Science and Mass Quiz begins with nine contests today at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. NSMQ giant and past winners like Infant Spam School, Achimota School, and St. Thomas Aquinas are beginning their journey from the preliminary stage with fans wondering 
whether they will be able to make it to the grand finale. Love FM's Emmanuel Bright Kweku joins us live from Kumasi with update. Emmanuel, today marks the beginning of the contest. How is uh, the, the, the whole day looking like? Imano, um, thanks for joining. W today marks the beginning of the contest. How is the day looking like from the onset? Um, again, I didn't hear your question. Okay, so just give us how the day is looking like uh, once today is the beginning of the contest. All right, so um, I'm currently here at the Sunyan um, Sarah Mensah Auditorium where the first contest for the day is underway. It features Nalerigu Senior High School. Mm -hmm. Um, the Northern School of Business, and then Sunyane Senior High School. The first round just ended, and Sunyane Senior High School so far has garnered 10 points. Um, Nalerigu also have five points, and Northern School of Business also has four points. And from all indications, Sunyane SHTS could be in the lead because um, last year they managed to beat their competitors by a whooping 58 points. So currently here, everything is calm at the moment, but the schools are hoping that they will gather momentum and then surpass Sunyani Senior High School currently here at the Sarah Mensah Auditorium. Um, today's contest are going to be in three forms. We are going to have one in the afternoon and also later around 4 p.m. Um, this morning is just as I said, um, Sunyani and then Naleribu. Later in the day, we'll be having um, St. James Seminary also having their contest and then the rest of the schools will follow. So this is actually the environment over here. The schools are poised that they are going to win this year's competition. They are poised to clear every step of the way, any hurdle that comes their way. They are hoping to clear it and then hopefully they will get to the final and make it to um, get their trophy to their schools. Mm. In terms of fans or participation of all students, how is it looking like today? And in terms of funds, as we speak at the moment, some old students are yet to report here. Um, we've seen a number of them, but not as in their numbers as before. So there are still they are still on with some students. I've seen some students coming through. So hopefully by the end of this particular contest, um, anyone who emerges winners will have their school jubilating with them. Mm. All right. So uh, the, this morning, Nalerigu, Nobisco, and Sunyai. Uh, in the afternoon, which schools are contesting? In the evening, which schools? Um, so in the e evening, um, in the afternoon, in the afternoon, we'll be having St. James Seminary SHS, Asin State College, and then Bongo Senior High School. And then around 3 p.m. or 4 p.m., hopefully, a Kufia Mayal SHTS would also join. Um, they will come up against Ofori Penny Senior High School and then Adyembra SHS. So that will be for the last contest of the day at this particular venue. That is the Sarah Mensah Auditorium. Mm. All right. Thank you very much. Now, um, once we're doing NSMQ, let's have a feel of how the whole contest looks like. A neutron. You are right. Another season is here and 135 schools keenly compete for one trophy. It's the 2022 National Science and Mass Quiz. Kumaso will once again host the creme de la creme from the 10th to the 26th of October. Find the initial speed of projection. Take G to be 10 meters per second squared. Sunyani. Samuel, go ahead. 100 meters per second. That is incorrect. Northern School of Business. 50 meters per second. That is correct. <laughs> Evaluate and simplify sine 60 degrees over the expression 1 minus cos 30 degrees. Sunyani, go ahead. 
Root three. Root three. Root three, that is incorrect. Northern School of Business. The expression with numerator two and the denominator one. That is incorrect. The answer is three plus two root three. Factorize completely x cubed minus 2x squared plus 1. Sunyani. Go ahead, Samuel. You have x to be 1 minus 1. That is incorrect. Northern School of Business, you rang. We have the expression x plus 1 squared multiplying the expression x plus 2. x plus 2. That is incorrect. Now let we go. x squared. In one but x square Please plus one. Please lift it up. X square plus one in one bracket and in the other bracket x minus one. That is incorrect. The answer is the expression x minus one multiplying the expression x squared minus x minus one. And that's the end of the speed race. All right, so you can feel how the contest is going. Let me take you to another venue uh, where Kwesi Debra is standing by to give us how uh, the processes are also going on there. Kwesi, where are you and what's been happening? De Debra, if, if you can hear me, kindly on mute so we can follow what you're telling us. Where are you exactly and what has been happening there? Okay, so we'll go back to Kwesi Debra to understand where he is and how the contest is also progressing there. In the meantime, let's move on to other stories. The management of the Tamana Rice Processing Factory at Nasia in the Northeast region has called on the Agri Ministry to urgently come to the aid of rice farmers whose rice fields have been invaded by Quilia Bert. Hundreds of farmers in the Nasia production enclave have reported the invasion and destruction of their rice farms by a flock of tiny migratory birds. Already, an estimated 2,000 hectares of rice fields belonging to outgrowers and smallholder farmers are said to have been destroyed by the rampaging birds. Chief Executive Officer of the Nasia Rice Processing Company, Alahaji Saibu Braima, says the situation is likely to cause raw material shortages, which could lead to a possible shutdown of production at the company. He also called on the government to fulfill its promise to support rice farmers and businesses listed under the One District One Factory Initiative. Elias Tanko has more in the following report. Rice farmers in the Nasia enclave in the Mampusi West municipality of the northeast region are counting huge losses following the attack on their rice farms by a flock of bears called the Quilia bears. These migratory bears come seasonally, especially when the rice starts producing seeds, as they usually suck the liquid content of the seed as well as eat the grain before it fully matures. Across vast schemes and several farms in the area, farmers are struggling to fight off these destructive pests that are said to have already destroyed an estimated 2,000 hectares of rice fields. Some of the methods deployed by these farmers in the fight against the destruction of their farms include the erection of scarecrows and the deployment of bears chasers to chase the bears away. However, these methods appear to have proven severely ineffective to stop the seasonal invasion of the bears. According to the farmers who claim most of them have refused to go into rice cultivation this year as they could not recover from the losses they suffered last year to the bad minutes. The farmers are now asking for the intervention of the agri-ministry. 
Mohamed Habib Abdullahi is the head of extension at the Tamana Rice Processing Company at Nasia, a company in addition to supporting outgrower farmers, also cultivate over 1,000 hectares of rice fields annually for its operations. He said the bears have destroyed about 67 hectares already. We have realized that the bears have uh, consumed a chunk of, that is almost uh, at least one tenth of the farm, which is highly significant. Uh, year in, year out, we shouldn't be making this massive loss as a company because okay. we are contributing much to food security issues. And for that matter, uh, there, need, there is a need for massive support from government to counter this major challenge that we are facing. The Tamana Company Limited, located in the West Mampresi municipality, began operations in 2015 and works with about 4,000 art growers, of which 40% of them are women. The company started operations with just a 40-ton rice mill, but has now been able to establish a 250 tons mill bringing its production capacity to nearly 300 tons per day. It is the only rice processing company in the Northeast region and has also been the only company to supply rice to all second cycle schools in the five regions of the North. The chief executive officer of the company, Al-Haji Seydou Braima, said the annual invasion of the bears was a threat to the operation of the company as well as food security in the country. I think last year, Northeast alone, over 35% of farmers lost their rice to uh, the best. And this year, majority of them haven't farmed just because they have already lost their rice to the farms who so they feel it bad or they feel it that if they farm again, this is the issue that will come. And most of the art growers that we normally buy from also lost their rice to uh, the best. I think we have a, a, a commercial farmer based in Janga. He did 500 acres last year. He did well. He didn't even have us one back. Oh. Due to this, the land is there. He has not even done even an acre. So we are also appealing to the government and those who matters. They have to come to the aid of the farmers, including ourselves. And this is a, mat it's a, it's a threat to the food security in Ghana. The CEO said a report about the situation was sent to the office of the Agric Ministry, but that they were yet to respond. He also bemoaned the lack of government attention to the plight of rice farmers and producers in the country. And let me even tell you, the government said, before even a distributor qualified to import rice into the country, the person has to uh, buy local rice 60% and we, they will give them clearance to come. And nobody in the country that is b uh, following it. They are buying, uh, importing over 100, uh, they are importing 100% of the uh, rice into the country. Nobody is buying from the, from us. If the government has supported the, the, the industry by reviving all this irrigation system, I'm sure by now they won't have been job uh, issues in the country. They won't have been uh, depreciation of our city. From Nasia, Elias Sutanko reporting for Joy News. Now, the Bono Regional Office of the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission has replaced about 38 rotting electricity poles that threatened resident of Salam Krum, a farming community in the Ngransa South Municipality. Regional Manager of the PRC, Patrick Enchi, emphasized that the commission would continue to monitor existing poles in the region and ensure that the threat of rotting poles are fully resolved by NETCO and Asabet reports. In all, a total of 38 rotting poles were replaced in Salam Krum, a predominantly farming community in the Nkranza South municipality of the Bono East region. This Yes, for watching the news desk on the Joy News channel. We'll take a quick break. When we return, we'll bring you letters from the world of business. Stay with us. Hi, welcome to business. My name is Daryl Kwao, president of Customer Experience Professionals Ghana. Esther Dukwo Fusuhine is calling on corporate firms to invest more in customer experience. Speaking at the CX Ghana 2022 conference to mark Customer Service Week, she highlighted the need for a deepened relationship between firms and their customers. Customer experience is a customer's holistic perception of their experience with a business or a brand. 
CS is the result of every interaction a customer has with a business from navigating the website to talking to customer service and receiving the products they bought from a firm. Dokua Ofusuhene admitted that Ghana has done well but would have to sustain the approach. So I think um, we've, we do good aco uh, across the industries. We are focused on the customer and that focus keeps increasing with time. This year we can see how many companies and organizations are celebrating the customer service week, which means that now we have gotten to the understanding of the importance of the customer. What we need to work on is how we deliver an intentional experience. Like you saw from the presentation from the CXPA, we need to design a strategy, we need to align it across the organizations. One of the challenges we are having in Ghana is the siloed working. So if you enter an organization, every department is working on its own and they don't really focus on the end customer or even the internal customer. That is one thing we need to look at. And also, just like the, from the presentation, we need to have a CEX representation in the C-suite. So at the executive level, we should have someone, the chief customer officer, the chief experience officer, driving CX and bringing the customer focus to every business decision. Patron at the event, Margaret H. Michael on her part, called for stronger institutions to engage customers more often. I think that to start with, we need commitment. And uh, commitment is not just from the executive level, but throughout the organization. If you listen to the insights that were given, most organizations do have a strategy. They do have a, a people looking after customer service. But customer service is everybody's business. But we tend to limit it to people who wear a hat called customer experience, customer service, and that limitation doesn't help. It is also across all channels. We call it the Omni channel. Every channel must provide that experience. Customer experience measures how customers feel about a company overall and includes the emotional, physical and psychological connection. Now 281 artisans in the Ashanti region have passed out of a certificate electricians, a certified electricians rather after undertaking their licensure examination. The 17th electrical wiring certification examination saw over 1,000 candidates nationwide sit and 800 successfully passing the exams. The annual examination is organized by the Energy Commission to ensure the safety of life and property in the use of electricity. There is more in this report. For nearly a decade, the Energy Commission has ensured the full implementation of the Electrical Wiring Regulations, LI2008, by producing certified electricians. The Commission has certified over 13,000 electricians after the enrollment of the training in 2013. Senior Officer Electrical Wiring at the Energy Commission, Fred E.J. Broby, says the certification aims at alleviating the rampant fires stemming from poor wiring of structures by non-professionals. The challenges that the, the law sought to, to eradicate or to reduce was the risk of fire outbreaks. And if you remember, some years ago, you would hear fire outbreaks in markets, in buildings, and people were losing their lives and property. And hence, the government at the time thought it wise to put together a law that will regulate this particular industry, just so that anybody who would want to engage in electrical wiring would be certified and duly registered under the Energy Commission before they can engage electrical wiring. When they come out successful, they are given some documentation which we call the ICCs, that is the Installation Completion Certificates. The training was in collaboration with the Ghana National Fire Service and the Ghana Police Service. The professionals went through domestic, commercial, industrial and inspectors training. Clement Anyam could not hide his joy after clinching the best certified electrical wiring professional inspector title. So, inspector journey was not easy. Because this is my third time, it was not easy. And it's going to help me in so many ways. Now it has opened my mind that every time the CWP I have to inspect their work. From day one, when we get the contract, we have to call the inspector to come and inspect the work. For Joy News, Emmanuel Wright's Kweku, reporting. Now, the Northern Regional Chairman of the Association of Ghana Industries, Alhaji Osman Kulendi, has expressed worry over low foreign investment attraction to Northern Ghana despite the abundance of natural and human resources in the area. Alhaji Kulendi noted less than 0.1% of foreign investments the country attracts come to the area. This, he says, not only shows a lack of attention to wealth creation in Northern Ghana, 
but also highlights the failure of the country's development and investment policies. The regional chairman of the Association of Ghana Industries, Alaji Osman Kolindi, expressed the worry of low foreign investment at this year's regional workshop and annual general meeting organized for members drawn from the five regions of the north. The meeting was to bring together major stakeholders and dominant corporate players into one umbrella to network. According to Ghana Investment Promotion Center, less than 0.5% of foreign investment attracted to the country come up here to the north. This does not only show lack of attention to wealth creation in northern Ghana, but also a challenge to the country's development and investment policy. <laughs> Colleagues here in present, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to inform you that there have been a series of engagements between AGI, the Tamale Technical University, and the University for Development Studies. GIZ and the World Food Program to support and upskill micro, small, and medium enterprises aimed at generating long term capital appreciation and to make private equity and certain preferred securities or debt investment in the agro business sector. This is aimed at contributing to inclusive economic development for us up here. Alaji Osman Kulindi said if the natural and human resources are properly harnessed, it will bring the area out of poverty and deprivation. We are blessed, as you all know, with natural and human resources. A lot of people think we up north here actually do not have resources. We do. The challenge we do face which limits the development of these resources is how to harness it and turn it into productive use. There is already, also as you know, a large market for market centers, especially the international market for our produce. The missing piece here is the value addition to this product that will make us very competitive. The chief executive officer of the AGI, Seth Chum Akwabwa, said the association has initiated grant package for members to help grow their business. Because individually you cannot advocate for yourself, we have to come together as an association and the association advocates for you to ensure that the business environment is conducive. We know that there have been some challenges in the system, but we believe that without the storm, eventually we will also see it. It's very important that we, we explore various incentives in the system and make that effort, that similar effort, individually to make sure that we, 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 we improve our business governance. Vice Chancellor of the Tamale Technical University, Professor Abbas Bremer, said the university is ready to partner with SMEs to grow their businesses. At Tamale Technical University, we have the expertise. Believe me, the young people are very, very smart. And when they are given the opportunity, they can drive the development of this country. And that is where I want you to come pick your next employee. The kids are, are very, very brilliant. Okay. And we want to nurture them for you. Okay. So I would like you to partner with us to train those students. Okay. Whatever skills you need, please let us know so that we will make sure that we impart those skills to a student. So upon graduation, they come to you ready for the work. Martina Bugge's report and then uh, the business segment's post is coming up next to stay tuned. Welcome back from the break, and uh, it's time for us to talk sports. Coming a day after the greatest player of all times, uh, you know, scored his 700th club goal. Uh, I mean, it was beautiful, CR7, you call him. But we're talking about women's football today, so let's talk about it. Lawrence, good morning, how are you? Good morning, Sam. <laughs> I'm good. 
How did they go over yeah, the weekend? Yeah. It, it was a good weekend for mm -hmm. women's football in mm -hmm. Ghana because we had the 2022-23 season get started over the weekend. One result or one game people were looking forward to was a clash of the debutants when Isam Socrates and Henry City took to the Madina Strative. Prior to the start of the game, there were heavy rains across the country mm -hmm. um, for most part in Accra. So there were suggestions the game would not go on. But then, you know, one thing, I, I never imagined people would go love for the women's game as I saw yesterday. Mm. In an encouraging number at the Madina Street, both teams took the field. For each city, it wasn't the best of results because they ended up three, losing 3-0. Three mm. People are so much interested in each city. I think their branding over the, the last two seasons or the last two years has played a key part. Rich city. Rich city. Mm. Has been a key part of they being the people's club, as, as people refer to them on, on social media. So the results from the Northern Zone, we have Pelpia ladies playing 0-0 with Prisons ladies, while Tamale Super ladies, who are also debutants, um, were held to a 1-1 draw against Ashtown ladies. And Pim Daokuan ladies played 1-1 against Northern ladies. Supreme ladies were 5-0 winners over Candy Soccer Academy, oh. while Fabulous ladies also won, uh, lost 2-3 at home to Dreams ladies. Oh. Yeah. That's the Kumasa Santo Kotoko ladies. Well, team. not an official Kumasa Santo Kotoko women's team. Oh. But then, yeah, they, they carry the name Fabulous. Um, so once they are using our logo, it means that, yeah. Oh. So at some point, we have Kotoko having a female team, but this at this point, okay. not yet. Okay. In the Southern Zone, you know that before the Southern Zone games, they were bragging rights, um, bragging like right between Berry ladies and then. Hazakes okay. ladies. Mm. That rivalry has, has been strong for quite some time now. Okay. And uh, the Hazak, uh, the very lady CEO was, was the one who brought it up. She was on our show, the um, women's pre preview That's show. That's uh, Gifting. Gifting. Kowari. Yes. Okay. And she said, well, uh, very ladies have beaten Hazakes ladies on a number of occasions. Well, they played four times, they've won once. So those comments, I didn't know where they were coming from. <laughs> but on Saturday, yes, Azakes uh, ladies proved their superiority again. They beat them one of zero. Course. Of so course. another result in the Southern Zone, Thunder Queens won two one against police ladies. Soccer intellectuals lost at home to Fate ladies. Lady strikers in the central region lost four zero at home to Army ladies. While Red City, as I mentioned earlier, also lost to Isiam Socrates. Mm. Now let's move to the men's game. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? Which one? When, when Kotoko lost their CAF Champions League game. Kadiogo. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which people did you hear making the loudest? Oh, of course. Uh, our better rivals, uh, Accra Hearts of Four. Imagine what happened yesterday. They lost by uh, hoping three, three goals to exactly. nothing, isn't it? But the match was played on, on, on uh, Saturday, isn't it? In Mali. Mm. Imagine the team is yet to start an official season. Mm -hmm. They're having pre-season. Mm. Hearts of Four have played three games in the Ghana Premier League. Mm and then Hearts go to Mali and then they drink three goals. Mm. But, but Hearts, Hearts have done it before. They've lost is it three nil away and have come to score four. Mm. So for me, yes, even though I think that it pays them well for how they mugged Kumasa and Tekosuko, but we need to relax. Hearts of Folk can do it no, my, and they can turn things up. My out. point is not mm. about Hearts of Folk, whether be, they can be able to do it. Mm -hmm. At the moment, mm. they don't have the materials, they don't have oh, okay. the mentality to stage that comeback that people are expecting them to do. Mm. How to folk have performed poorly. I think in the last eight games they've played in the league, they, they are yet to pick up a win. Oh, really? It doesn't speak well of a club like How to Folk. Because if, if you, you, at the moment, you don't have a head coach, because it's the assistant um, head coach who is in David Oklo, who was formerly with Kumasa. He's acting in the interim. Good. So if you have an assistant uh, head coach who is yet to know the team, and then you've lost your first leg 3-0. Coming back, you don't, uh, even the supporters are, are not with the courage that Hearts can stage a comeback. It will take some miracle. And I say this on authority, not that Hearts can do it. It would take something extraordinary for Accra to folk to sail through to the next round of the Cup Confederations Cup. You think the materials they have cannot do it? At the moment, they are not playing any football that anyone will bet on them. To overcome AS Bamako okay. at the Accra Sports Stadium in the return league. Yes, so Bamako they, is also a powerful team. On the that African is it. Continent. And the, the fact that they are only playing preseason and yet to start their official season, and they have beaten out of folk by three goals to nil. 
It speaks volumes of, of our league. Or but again, of, I of think the teams that we, should, we should change the discussion to discuss how Ghana football in general has, you know, deteriorated over the years. Yeah. Because if you look at in the past, Afri Ghanaian teams go to, the to African the competitions, competitions and, we, and well. we go with some verve because we know we will do it. But today, everybody meet a Ghanaian team and we, they beat us like, like what people say on social media, Oto Oto. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's something that we should discuss. Yeah. What yeah, is going wrong so. with our local league such that when we go on to the continental stage, we are not able to showcase what we have. I, what is really lacking? I, I actually would say it's a, it's a case of talent because we have the talent in this country. Mm. What I feel has been the majority cause over the past years is the question of infrastructure. Okay. We've not been able to put up better infrastructures to facilitate mm. some of these talents mm. that may grow and then become world beaters. Okay, all right. Um, again, over the weekend, like I said, Cristiano Ronaldo finally uh, was able to score a goal in this season's EPL yes. to reach his 700th uh, cl career club goals. Uh, if you look at the total, I think he's done some 819 yep. uh, career goals, uh, 119 for country, 700 for... I like uh, how you are putting out the figures. Oh, yeah, exactly. It, right. make, it makes me feel those years when people were so much in love with Cristiano Ronaldo. Yeah. You know, he's not been the same Cristiano Ronaldo. Oh, yeah, Ronaldo we know. Known for. But then, 37 years going to 38. We appreciate that, yes. He's given us much love we've loved with i mean what hasn't cristiano ronaldo done mm. so yeah so over the weekend when he's he not won the world cup he's not yeah, that's, no, that's no 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 problem for another day yeah his country had not won the Euro europa league uh the, yeah. is the, is the, the Euros. european cha championship yes then he has a captain won it for portugal you know so he's done a lot of things that people before him were not able to do people after him may be able to win the world cup but for what he's been able to do to football ah I like your passion. Yeah. First, like I'm the host, that's and, and then you're the guest. Yeah, that's what it is when you're talking to a Ronaldo <laughs> fan. Uh, but Pate too is doing some some oh, incredible yeah. football. Yeah. He's playing some incredible football. I like the, the whole Arsenal team, and then Pate is key to it. Mm. You know how they didn't lose their focus, okay. and then despite being pegged twice, they still went ahead to clinch all three points against Liverpool. Kudos to them. All right, and that's how we wrap up the bulletin today. There's more news on myjoyonline.com. My name is Samuel Kojo. Brace to enjoy the rest of our programs. Have a great morning.